Welcome to another edition of the Law and Gospel Devotional, and Happy New Year to you. My name is Eric Sorensen, and each week I gather with you to look at God's two words, both his word of law, which tells us everything we ought to do, and points out the many ways in which we haven't done it, and most importantly, his word of gospel, which ultimately points us to all God has done for us in our salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Well, after a week off in which we celebrated our, our Lord's birth and then ushered in the new year yesterday, it's good to be back here again with you to discuss a very important topic. We're going to be looking at the topic of baptism today because Romans 6, 1 through 11 is our passage and there's tons and tons about baptism in there. But before we do that, I want to let you know about a few options for you if you're looking to grow in your knowledge of God's Word. First of all, if you are not on Instagram, I'd encourage you to go over to Instagram, sign up, get an account. Even if you are, follow the 1517 account because on the 1517 account are daily videos. There are all sorts of videos made by Chad Bird in which he's uh, leading like a year-long Bible reading plan. And his videos are just wonderful nuggets of gold wisdom. I'd highly encourage you to check out Chad and the 1517 page. I also make videos over there, though not nearly as profound as my friend Chad. Nevertheless, they're all there for free for you to grow in your knowledge of God's Word. Secondly, in relation to that, most of you, I think, know who are watching this that I am the co-host of a podcast called 30 Minutes in the New Testament. Well, recently, we just finished the New Testament, and so you might think that we're done with that podcast. But au contraire, my friend, no, we are going to continue on with the podcast albeit a little differently than in the past. For starters, when we get back together this week, we're actually releasing a new episode. Uh, for four weeks, we're going to go over some hot-button issues that the New Testament addresses. So we're going to talk about baptism. We're going to talk about the Lord's Supper. We're going to talk about why we still struggle with sin. And we might even talk about some political issues that the New Testament addresses in the next four weeks. But then in February, we're going to reconvene. We're going to start over in the Gospel of Matthew, but this time a couple differences. Number one, it's not just going to be Daniel Emery Price and myself. No, this time for each book of the New Testament, we're going to have a special guest theologian or pastor or, or somebody who's an expert on the material at hand. For each book of the Bible, we'll have a special guest with us the entire time. And then in case you're one of those people that much prefers to learn by watching rather than listening, we are going to begin to record video of the 30 Minutes in the New Testament podcast. So you're, if you're interested in watching uh, Dan and I when we go over the scriptures, well, now that's going to be an option for you once we start the New Testament again in February. So if you're looking to grow in your knowledge of God's Word and go a little deeper, those are just a few resources for you that I'd encourage you to check out. All right, speaking of going deeper in God's Word, let's do that because that's what we're here to do, right? Uh, we're looking at today one of my absolute favorite passages in the New Testament, a real life-changing passage for me, honestly. I got it, I mean, for real. Um, this passage is one of those passages that changed my entire view of baptism. I didn't grow up in the tradition that I'm now a part of in the church. In the tradition I grew up in, baptism was always talked about uh, in this way, an outward sign of an inward change. It was talked about as being purely symbolic, that it had no other meaning than that. And that was so ingrained in me that when I began attending a church that taught something different, I challenged the pastor there for about two years with every possible argument I could to try and debunk the view that God is doing something in baptism. And part of what caused me to embrace that position, that baptism is a means of grace, not something that we do for God, but something God does for us. Well, Romans 6, 1 through 11, our passage today was one of those key passages that brought me to the position I hold today, that it is God doing the verbs and not me. Now, what is the overall passage in Romans 6 all about? Well, it's really about what Gerhard Ferdi would say. It's really about the art of getting used to your justification. It's about learning what it means to lean on the grace of God for everything, not just your justification, but your sanctification and eventually your glorification. And so we're going to be talking about all of that in the context of discussing what God's word actually says about baptism. So 
to bring you just a little context here, Romans 6, right before that, Paul says in 5.18, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increases, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Man, how good is God? How giving and gracious is our God that even though our sin has caused such tremendous havoc to ourselves and to those around us, God is in the business of restoration and forgiveness and abounding grace to us. And so we just can't help but say, I don't deserve you. I mean, Paul is just dropping gospel bomb after gospel bomb in chapter 5. But of course, whenever the gospel is proclaimed so unabashedly like that, there's immediately a question that comes into our minds, no matter who we are. And that question is this, verse 1, what are we to say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? I mean, if it's all grace, Paul, from start to finish, does that mean that I should just go on living like a hellion and do whatever I want? Because after all, you know, God's going to forgive me. Is it like what W.H. Auden once said? I like committing crimes. God likes forgiving them. Well, there is a logic to that position, but you're going to find out that Paul frankly hates that logic. He says in response, by no means. How can we who die to sin still live in it? I mean, it's almost as if Paul is offended. He says, heaven forbid, it's the strongest way of refuting a particular point. No, being saved by grace does not give you license to go out and just sin against yourself and against everybody else around you. No, Paul will make the case that the reason that can't be is because that old nature has been killed. That old sinful nature has been declared dead. Now, where, O oh Paul... Did this happen to us Christians? When did we die to Lord sin? Well, this is what the apostle will say. Verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Now, let's just take that apart very carefully. A couple very important details about what Paul just said. First of all, Paul does not say anything here about baptism merely symbolizing your death to Lord sin. As a matter of fact, there is not a single verse, a single passage anywhere in the entirety of the Bible that refers to baptism as a mere symbolic action that we do for God. No, it's just not there. Dig through the scriptures if you don't believe me, but I'm going to give you the shortcut answer. It doesn't exist. In fact, what Paul says, straight up, just reading the text as it's written, in your baptism you died. That is to say, in the sight of God, when you were baptized, the old Adam was declared to be dead. God really does something in baptism. He, he kills and he makes alive. And then secondly, very important, the fact that Paul uses the subjunctive mood here in verse 4, that we too, quote, might walk in newness of life, hints to us that even though we have been declared dead and alive in the sight of God via baptism, it does hint to the fact that we will still battle with sin in this life. This passage, so it's very important. This passage is not, I repeat, not teaching some sort of perfectionism. And if you had any question about whether that's accurate, all you have to do is go to the next chapter where Paul goes through a series of verses confessing his ongoing struggle with sin. In particular, it seems he was struggling with the sin of covetousness. That's found in chapter 7, verses 14 through 25. So, very important to note what God is doing in baptism. He is killing 
and he's making a life. He's actively doing something for us. Now, how does he do it? Verse 5, For if we have been united, perfect indicative, with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united, future indicative, with him in a resurrection like his. How does he do it? Well, he reunites us to him in baptism. We become united to Christ, one with Christ, seen as if we're completely covered in the righteousness of Christ, and therefore the old Adam is declared to be dead and gone. And yet you say, well, I still struggle with sin. Well, here's the way the scripture often works. There's this sense in which we are declared something right now on account of our faith, even though our lives don't necessarily reflect what we're declared to be. I mean, we're declared to be righteous, again, on account of Jesus, and yet we know every single day that we fall short of the standard God laid out in his word, that we fall short of the law. And yet one day, one day in the future, because of our united, uh, being united to Christ, we confidently know that one day the sin that we still struggle with, even though we've been baptized, buried, and made alive, that one day that will be truly gone forever. And so that is the Christian's hope. And that is what gives the Christian the ability to walk more and more in the ways of God. Not something that we have to do, but something that we get to do based on who he says we are. So what then is the purpose of baptism? Well, Paul goes on in verse 6, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. That's subjunctive mood again. So that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. That's a present active verb. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live, future indicative, with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has mass dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. Now you see what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that the purpose of baptism is that we are set free to actually live, that we have been delivered from the bondage and the mastery of sin over our lives. Again, this is not saying that we won't struggle with sin continuously until we finally meet the Lord face to face, whether that be by death or by his second coming. But either way, the purpose of the baptism is that you would be a new creation. And that's what Jesus gives us in that gift. And then we finally come to the end of the passage we're looking at today. And funny enough, it's the first imperative in the entire book of Romans so far. Isn't that crazy? You have to wait until chapter 6, verse 11 to get an imperative. And what is that imperative that Paul has for the church? So you also must consider yourselves, imperative, dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. I think this is so important. This is, notice the word consider or reckon. The idea is that you have to have it told to you and then you have to believe it. So each and every day, no matter what the struggle is, you're, you're telling yourself and you're hearing from others, I am not my sin. I am a new creation in Christ Jesus and therefore am not bound to it. Again, just to illustrate the difference between status and sort of growing into your status. If you've ever seen the movie The Last Emperor, you've seen a good picture of this. In that story about the last emperor of China, the, uh, the emperor takes the throne, I think at two years old because he was the one in line and his parents had, had died early. And so he was the emperor. Now, from that moment when he was two years old or whatever it was, he was truly the emperor of China. And yet what the film goes on to show for the rest of the time is him learning to grow into the title he's already been bestowed. He's learning what it means to be an emperor, even as he already is an emperor. So you are already declared to be righteous in the sight of God on account of Jesus Christ. And yet the rest of our life, we're going to be growing into that, learning that through stops and starts, through stumbles and falls. And yet in the end, through God uh, continuing his work and keeping his promises to us, he will bring us to the point where our reality will be completely matched up. We will no longer be battling the old Adam even as the old Adam has been declared to be dead. So how do we consider ourselves dead to sin, but alive to God? Well, in this case, I'm going to tell you 
uh, Luther absolutely nails it because he says, remember your baptism. For Luther, baptism was an ongoing reality each and every day. He would say things like, every time you wash your face, remember that you are baptized. Remember what God says he did for you in that baptism. Remember who God has declared you to be. To quote Luther again from his large catechism, he says, baptism is not a work that we do, but a treasure that God gives us and faith grasps. In baptism, therefore, every Christian has enough to study and practice all his or her life. Thus, we must regard baptism and put it to use in such a way that we may draw strength and comfort from it when our sins or conscience oppress us and say, but I am baptized. And if I have been baptized, I have the promise that I shall be saved and have eternal life, both in soul and body. Well, that is a heck of a mic drop statement. And it is so, so imperative that as you consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God, that you go back to that baptism on a daily basis, that every day you remind yourself, I am a baptized child of God, and therefore I am more than a conqueror through him who loved me. So where do we see the law and the gospel in Romans 6, 1 through 11? Well, just for a reminder, the law reveals our condition as fallen sinners, right? Well, this passage is full of reminders that we need to die to sin. It's commanding us in verse 11 to live as though we are, in fact, really dead to sin. But, of course, the gospel comes in and declares that in our baptism, we have already been crucified with Christ. And because we've been crucified with Christ, we have hope. We have victory over all the things that plague us, all the sins that ensnare us, and we have nothing but glory to look forward to in the hereafter because we know God cannot lie and always keeps his promises to finish the job he started with us. Well, folks, I hope that encourages you and gives you some clarity about baptism. If you ever have any questions about baptism, by the way, or any other issue, I'm happy to answer those to the degree I can. Just feel free to leave that in the comments and I'll get to it as soon as I can. Many blessings to you in your 2024. May God richly bless you this week and beyond. We'll see you next week.